infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. Now, my guest today focuses her research on why diseases occur and how those diseases influence wildlife populations. One example is chronic wasting disease, or CWD, which is a fatal condition that is now affecting cervid populations throughout the country, which include deer, elk, and moose. And uh, today we'll be focusing a little bit on Michigan, but it's affecting a lot of other states also. Um, and that will be today's topic. So joining me now is Sonia Christensen, PhD. Dr. Christensen is an assistant professor in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife in Michigan State University's College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Dr. Christensen, welcome to the show, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. Well, let's go ahead and start with some of the basics for the audience. We've talked about prions on this on this program previously, uh, but just to give them a little summary, um, what are prions and more specifically, what is chronic wasting disease? Yeah, so chronic wasting disease is uh, an infectious disease that is prion based. So those prions or prions, however you want to say it, um, they're basically all proteins that have been uh, sort of misformed and reformed in a way that's infectious. So when those infectious proteins touch another protein that hasn't been infected yet, it, it sort of triggers a reaction that unfolds a protein and refolds it so then it becomes infectious. So it is infectious in that way. Um, it's an amazing disease because it's not alive. It's not like a bacteria or something. Um, and it, you know, we're all, we're made of protein, so it's really hard to target in terms of treatments or vaccines such as that. So chronic wasting disease as a, a prion disease is similar to other uh, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, which are also like scrapie and sheep um, or mad cow, uh, BSE bovine spongiform encephalopathy in, in cattle. And of course, with that disease system, we know that there was that linkage um, to humans through variant creutzfeldt jakob disease. So hasn't happened in, that connection hasn't happened with chronic wasting disease, but certainly a concern. Sure. Now, how common is CWD and um, in the U.S.? And what is the history of this disease in the U.S.? Because it, it's kind of a new thing that we're hearing about, but we're hearing about it more and more. Yeah, it's a challenging one. Um, it's it's something that's actually been around since the, the, probably the late 60s when it was first detected in uh, Colorado and southern uh, Wyoming. And it was found in some laboratory animals, actually, well, research animals um, in those facilities. And it hasn't been a fast moving disease in some perspectives, because since that time, it sort of had the slow creep. And this this disease system really seems to have sort of um, slow spread uh, adjacent to where we know there are some hot spots, and then you get these sort of big jumps where their new foci pop up from time to time, and then they start to slowly spread. So if you were to look at a map now compared to even 20 years ago, there's a big difference. And it seems like that slow spread is really starting to ramp up a bit in some places. Now that there's enough new foci and enough lo locations um, with deer having this infectious disease that it's really starting to gain some momentum in some areas, but it's not everywhere yet. Uh, in Michigan, it, it first uh, popped up and well, actually in a captive cervid population, a farm cervid uh, facility in 2008, but then in a free ranging population, not until 2015. So that's when Michigan uh, Department of Natural Resources first detected it, at least on the landscape. Uh, but certainly our neighbor uh, across the lake uh, in Wisconsin, they've been battling this disease since 2002. And again, if you look at a map, um, USGS actually puts out a really nice map that they update regularly. You can see some of these hotspots just sort of spreading out and then these new foci jumps happening in a few places. What states are hardest hit by this? 
Um, the, the hardest hit are often the ones who have been longest hit. So uh, again, it's a sort of slow spreading disease and it's always fatal. And it's like a contaminant because not only is it uh, transmitted between deer um, through saliva, urine, feces, et cetera, it's, it, it can, the prion can actually stay in the soil and the environment and be indirectly transmissible to deer um, even after maybe a dead deer uh, has long uh, disintegrated into the back into the uh, the earth, or that maybe an infectious deer has passed by, like spread some prions through urine or feces, is long gone. But those infectious prions, at some level, if there's enough of them, can be infectious to another deer. So um, again, it, it sort of builds up over time. That's what we see. So places where it's had. Um, that have detected this disease the earliest often are the ones we see um, sort of those those hottest fires. Although um, I will say, for example, Tennessee is a state where they sort of revised some of their surveillance plans. And once they started looking in some new places, they found that it was already much higher in apparent prevalence than they expected. And so their fire was burning uh, much more than they thought. Um, and in Arkansas as well, actually. Um, so Arkansas was probably more the poster child for that in some ways. Um, and yeah, again, we see this Wisconsin has got a large hotspot um, in southeast Wisconsin, um, northern Illinois. We see the, the area that we first detected it, uh, of course, Wyoming, um, Colorado are basically enzootic, which means that it's, you know, fairly established there, too. Now, now, with human prion disease, um, we know the incubation period can be decades sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, how long is the incubation for CWD and what kind of symptoms do you see in a deer or an elk? Yep. So this is another thing that's very challenging about this disease in terms of management. With some diseases, they get sick quickly. You can identify them and they're they're, uh, they've succumbed to the disease quickly, so they don't have a lot of time to spread it around. But with uh, chronic wasting disease, they actually don't really look sick often until almost two years after being first exposed, perhaps. So usually in white-tailed deer, um, we see something around 10, 15 months, up to maybe 24 months for incubation periods. And then, you know, maybe just a couple months once they've reached that clinical sign, and they really start to succumb to the disease. And it's, again, always fatal. For elk, it's a little bit longer, up to maybe three years. Uh, but it can be really misleading then. So if somebody's hunting in a tree stand or seeing deer eating their hostas out in their backyard or something, that, that deer might look really healthy. But in fact, it could be actively shedding infectious prions. And, and nobody would really know the difference unless you actually took a look at that deer. Now, when they do start getting really sick, they have signs that actually mirror some other diseases that we see in deer, but generally very lethargic, sort of droopy ears. Ears are sort of a telltale sign for deer in terms of their health, that they're really droopy ears. That's not usually a great sign. Very skinny, emaciated. Um, and then it's a neurological disease, right? It really affects that central nervous system. And really those prions, it's, it's almost eating away or making that spongy sort of brain matter. So they are, they're really neurologic. They're really not behaving regularly. They might be drooling. Um, so they, they're in really rough shape at the end there. Well, hunting season is uh, going on in Michigan and probably a whole bunch of other states. Yep. Um, so any concern for hunters? And, and, and if you get a chance, I'd like, I'd like you to just tell us um, what's the situation with that in Michigan specifically? Oh, it's a tough one, right? Because yeah. <laughs> uh, there's such a culture around deer hunting. Um, there's a culture around deer viewing and just seeing deer, loving deer people. A lot of people either love them or hate them <laughs> one way or the other based on if they've been eating your garden or you hit one with a car or if you're hunting them or just like to see them. So uh, in Michigan, it's it's been challenging, but I think, you know, the Michigan DNR has done as good as they can to try to address this issue, uh, doing a lot of surveillance and monitoring when they first found the disease, sort of reevaluating their surveillance plans more recently, but, um, and establishing where they know that disease is. But certainly as hunters are out there harvesting deer and, and Michigan's a big uh, white-tailed deer hunting state for sure, mm -hmm. I would, you know, I think folks are definitely cautious. Um, now, 
people hunt for all sorts of different reasons, whether it's just to get meat in the freezer or they're after that really big monster buck. So it kind of depends on what, you know, what people's values are around why they're hunting and how they might be hunting in terms of what their risk and personal risk level might be for CWD. But in general, I'd say if a sick deer walks by your stand um, and you shoot it, that's just fine. But try to get it tested uh, before you eat it. I certainly wouldn't want to eat a sick looking deer. Um, and again, even though we know that CWD hasn't clearly jumped to humans in any documentation yet, you don't really want to push the envelope there. Um, and, and I probably wouldn't test that. <laughs> uh, you don't want to be the, the guinea pig there. Don't want to be the first one, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. So, um, but there's lots of other good reasons around wanting to have healthy deer populations, right? So as this um, disease keeps affecting deer, you know, we have really high deer densities right now, but we've seen in many studies, for example, out in Wyoming and Colorado, um, and there's some active studies going on in Wisconsin and Arkansas right now, how the populations are actually impacted by this disease. And over time at high prevalence levels, those populations can decline. And really it's probably gonna kill those older big bucks uh, more, um, you know, simply because they're older, they've had the disease longer, they've had more chances to pick up the, the prions, the infectious um, pathogen. So um, you're going to be seeing a younger age structure in, in your deer population, probably less trophy animals overall down the road, lower deer populations in some places might be a good thing, but you don't want them dying from disease. You know, if we can manage those herds to be a sustainable level without um, the disease part kicking in, that's always, that's always sort of what we're hoping for. Well, well how can you do, how can you do that, Dr. Yeah, Christensen? How can you um, slow it down or, or stop it? It's, I, I'm going to say it's almost impossible. I think that there's been very few examples um, in terms of management where there have been a few silver linings and a few positive outcomes. So uh, for one example, New York State, uh, they've detected chronic waste and disease in first a captive cerved, uh, farm, a farm cerved location. And then shortly thereafter, a couple of free ranging animals um, in their state. And the state was very aggressive with their removal of um, animals off the landscape. So they reduced local deer densities very quickly, had a very quick response plan. And they have not detected that disease since, like post 10 years later. So that was 2005. Um, so they've been pretty lucky. And there's a few other places across the country where in localities, there's been a, a positive that popped up, but then with some aggressive management, removing a lot of deer locally, um, that they haven't found uh, new cases. So that's one way to do it. But of course, that's a um, tough medicine to take because a lot of folks really value their local deer populations and don't want to see those actions happen. So the best thing that we can do really is trying to prevent those infectious prions, those uh, those CWD proteins uh, coming in in the first place. And prevention is is always the first action, right? So it's hard to, hard to do that. And it's hard to um, get excited about prevention activities sometimes, but it's really where we can try to avoid having this disease eat up resources for other wildlife that we care about um, and, and keep it out as long as we possibly can. Okay, I, I wanna go ahead and close with um, a little bit about what you do and yeah. um, give you an opportunity to talk about some of your research with CWD and other diseases that afflict wildlife populations. I know that's that's your gig, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and I feel super lucky that I get to research something that I love and mm -hmm. work with folks that also love the same thing. So it's been really fun. Um, so yeah, I, I studied diseases in general and how diseases affect wildlife populations. So a lot of my work is actually just estimating wildlife populations. So just that question of how many are out there that's a question that comes up a lot, but we actually, it's really hard to answer that. And then when we try to say, okay, so how did this disease affect that population? You don't really know unless you have a good local uh, estimate for that wildlife population to see what a change was or an impact was. So I do those things. Um, disease ecology is really about understanding a different pathogen system and all of the players. So there's the environment, there's the, the host, and then there's the pathogen itself, whether it's a virus or a bacteria or a prion, infectious prion. So I, I think that's a really interesting part of my job. Some of the work I do on chronic wasting disease has really shifted towards um, 
looking at human behavior and seeing how as humans, we might better mitigate the spread of chronic wasting disease. Certainly we have a role in moving deer around the landscape, whether, um, you know, captive service industries are trying to do this for, you know, their business livelihoods or, um, or hunters are moving uh, infection, infected carcasses around and maybe not knowing it, making sure we have good practices in place so that we're not spreading those, those animals around, um, not congregating deer in high densities when we can avoid it so they aren't contacting each other more and then further uh, infecting more animals. Uh, so hunter behavior, landowner behavior is a big project I'm currently working on. I have a master's student looking at landowner acceptance um, of chronic waste and disease management on private land. So we have a big survey out right now looking at that. Um, and then one project I've been working on is messaging to hunters, trying to see some different um, sort of video clips that we used and, uh, and a kind of a treatment control approach to see if different messages that were really high production quality sort of PSA type videos were effective or not, where we uh, surveyed hunters before they went deer hunting and then um, and then at the end of the season, okay, what did you actually do in the field? Because you told us in the survey you were going to do this, but what did you really do? Which is tough, again, because people tend to do what they, they consistently do over time. So um, I've done a lot of collaboration, collaborating with economists and human dimensions folks. Um, and then my, some of my recent research has also been on looking at how two disease systems actually interact with each other. So another disease system I work on that has affected Michigan and is actually in the Southeast where you're at, um, uh, enzootic or endemic, uh, is epizootic hemorrhagic disease or blue tongue disease, or they're both basically hemorrhagic diseases. They're sort of indistinguishable. Um, and that disease, that's a virus, and it actually kills a lot of deer very quickly, especially where they're naive in northern states like up here in Michigan. And we're seeing a lot more EHD outbreaks happen, and we also have that in areas that have CWD. So I've done some analysis with a collaborator, Dr. Strasberg, to see how those um, play out and if maybe this disease EHD is actually maybe a silver lining for buffering CWD coming into a place. Um, and then I do a lot of collaborative work. So I work with the CBD Research Consortium, which is a consortium of scientists across the country and Canada, international, um, looking at different research projects for CWD. We have partners at Cornell University doing great stuff on surveillance. We have folks doing really interesting stuff with different diagnostics. Um, again, human dimensions work, a variety of sort of priority issues around CWD. Um, but when I'm not doing CWD or episodic hemorrhagic disease, I am usually working with state agencies to answer other questions around deer ecology and management. Um, even SARS-CoV-2, uh, some of those things came up, you know, in the last few years and how, how that was uh, actually fairly prevalent in the deer population. So lots of interesting questions out there. I'm just trying to uh, chip away at a few of these so we can help manage our, our wildlife populations as best as we can. I'm just a little curious about um, how well the uh, Department of Agriculture up there, the education and the information that's getting out there. Are, are you finding that hunters are informed or are they still unaware of this? You know, actually, based on some of our survey work, we always ask, like, have you heard of CWD? Uh, where'd you hear about it? Um, and and we've worked with partners at National Deer Association with their membership um, about this. And we've worked, I've done other surveys that aren't associated with any association or club. And it seems like actually in Michigan and the upper Midwest, a lot of hunters are aware of it, at least they've heard of it. They know that it's, you know, bad for deer, nasty now, whether they are personally seeing those impacts yet, it's a different story. Again, that kind of de uh, depends on what their personal experience that might be or why they're hunting, what their personal concerns are, if they're feeding venison to their kids and their family. Um, but I think in general, there's pretty good information out there about what chronic waste and disease is and that this affects deer. Um, I know uh, the Meat Eater podcast, Steve Rinella had a show on CBD. So the podcasts are getting out the good information and uh, like yourself. And again, I think that folks are paying attention to that. It's just, um, again, if it's not affecting you immediately, always it's hard to really see the, the, the need or the issue there. Um, but I do think Michigan DNR has done a good job with getting the word out and a lot of other states um, 
certainly have big uh, outreach and communication efforts and they're they're improving all the time too so yeah yeah okay excellent uh, I want to thank you Dr. Sonia Christensen for sharing your time and expertise with us today I appreciate it ma'am thank you so much Robert it's really been a pleasure you're welcome <laughs>